because of the wonderful partnership that we've had with them over a number of years. And during the ongoing budget cuts to public education that have taken place, Calvary has provided assistance on the projects that either wouldn't have been completed due to lack of funding or would have taken funds away from other things that also needed addressing. Although the list is long, some of the things that Calvary has provided the district in the past few years are, when Daytona Middle School was closed in 2009, Members of the church provided assistance in moving furniture and equipment to Thunderbolt Middle School from Daytona. There have been several instances in which Calvary Baptist provided manpower for painting projects. Some of them are showing um, up there on the screen. These included fencing at Smoke Tree Elementary in 2013, fencing at Thunderbolt Middle School in 2014, Nautilus fencing and curves in 2015, and fencing at the Lake Havasu High School in 2016. The church has also paid for the Lake Havasu High School baccalaureate invitation postage, provided gift cards to district teachers, and hosted an annual educator's appreciation breakfast at each site in the district, among many other things. Again, we want to express our sincere appreciation to Calvary Baptist Church for valuing education in our community and for being a wonderful partner for many, many years. So please join me in thanking them for all that they've done. Uh, I just wanted to, to, to thank you for, for recognizing us. And uh, at Calvary, we realize that the, the teachers and educators in this community are really the ones that are enacting change. And, and how we invest and lead our children to course, uh, determines the course of our community and our city and, and where we go uh, from here. And so we're just grateful to have a partnership with you guys. Uh, we don't realize very that educators are under-resourced to make things happen, and our district is, is no exception from that. So we're just thankful to have an opportunity to serve and to the needs where we see them and, and hope to be able to continue. Certificate of appreciation. Well, thank you, thank so you very much. much. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. Okay, and Mike, are you here? There you go. Madam President, members of the governing board, <clears throat> to piggyback on what was just uh, mentioned here, our community is definitely uh, rich in abundance with community support, uh, community volunteers, those people who are willing to step up and help not only our school district, but also our city as a whole. Tonight, um, I'd like to recognize a few individuals who contributed greatly to not only our district, but specifically to Starline Elementary School. Um, and it's actually interesting to me, I wrote it here on my card, that Next month, the London Bridge Days Parade uh, will have the title, A Salute to Volunteers. So that goes hand in hand to what we see day in and day out in our school district and also monthly here in these meetings. We definitely salute our volunteers and appreciate their efforts. On the um, screen up here, you'll notice that there are a few pictures of uh, the recent events at Starline Elementary. And all of these uh, photos and these projects, both great and small, 
have been a result of the volunteers within our community, and namely uh, Sherwin Williams here in Lake Havasu City, as well as the Tri City Tri City area. Uh, we started on a smaller scale, and it's not very small if you think about it. But compared to our final project uh, at the end of last school year, where Sherwin Williams donated all of the paint and supplies to paint the exterior of Starline Elementary School. You can imagine that the cost to do that, if we were to pay for that, um, not just only in materials but in labor, would have been um, quite, quite a bill for the district. And that was accomplished through volunteer effort, both in resources and supplies and just man hours of um, just good old-fashioned labor. These two photos down below, we started small, like I mentioned, where uh, Sherman Williams donated the paint and supplies to um, give our office a little bit of a, a facelift and a touch-up. And this is an elementary school, <coughs> and also in uh, direct alignment with our high school with, with purple. Uh, Starline colors are purple and silver. And we added that splash of purple both inside and outside the building. Again, it's an elementary school, it's, it's inviting, it um, makes the kids uh, kind of come alive and appreciate getting out of the car in the morning and just seeing something bright and cheery. So with that, um, there's some key people in the audience tonight that I'd like to, to recognize. Um, and I hate it when I do this, but um, this tugs at my heartstrings because these people donated their time. They donated resources to help our school district and to make our community just a, a little bit more of a, a bright and cheery place on Starling Drive. Um, Pablo Morales is our store, is the store manager of the Lake Havasu City Sherwin Williams. He's sitting right here in the second row. And he was um, basically the individual who set this set this um, forth. And he he became the uh, contact person and the kind of the cheerleader, if you will, or just wanting to really see this um, come to fruition and to, to come to life. Uh, there's also another individual I'll recognize here at the end who um, stepped up and served equally with him. So Pablo Morales is the store manager at Lake Havasu City. Tony Jarvis is the sales representative. Jose Serna, the district manager. Renee Deloria, the store manager in the Kingman North facility. Victoria Cox, the store manager in the Kingman South um, Sherwin Williams store. Jason Mitchell, the store manager in Bullhead City. Juan De La Torre was the Graco sales rep. He was, uh, it was actually kind of funny to watch him because uh, he was the man that had all the goodies for the painters. The contractors just loved him because he had all of the supplies that the painting contractors wanted for their equipment. And uh, Juan was very generous. He, uh, he gave freely of different parts and, and fittings for the painting contractors to use on this job. Uh, painting contractors Vince Seiler and R.K. Ramirez, <coughs> Chuck Tresher and Rick Rommel from Blue Line Custom Solutions, Ryan Sampson from the Great American Painting and Rand Randy Frederick from Randy's Painting. All of these individuals gave up their time, uh, their weekends, to make Starline just more inviting and just a, a, a fresh new place for our kids to come to. So with that, I'd like these, uh, these gentlemen and, and ladies if they're here to come forward. Uh, I know that we have some of the uh, governing board president for you. Yeah, they're, they're here. Okay, the can I give you these to, to make sure that they get Graco, Blue Line Custom Solutions, Great American Painting, just these. Uh, Randy's Painting, Vince Seiler, and R.K. Ramirez? Okay? Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, um, an individual.
individual who uh, who definitely was a driving force in this as well. She gave of her time, much of it. Uh, she's one of my teachers on, on staff. She's extremely creative. She's extremely giving. Uh, she's a rising leader in this profession and hopefully in this community. And she never asked for anything other than she was there, uh, usually even before me, at, at ODAR 30 in the morning to start the project. And often she was there after I left, at ODAR 30 in the evening, actually, as the sun was going uh, So I'd like to publicly recognize Shauna Smith for her efforts in seeing this project to completion and the many volunteers of, of our staff at Starline who came and gave up their Saturdays to make this come about. excited to share with you tonight that our elementary principals are here to introduce their new teaching staff. They have six weeks under their belt, so I'm sure they're old hats by now. But um, we'll go ahead and uh, start with Connie Pogart and Smoke Tree Elementary School. She'd like to introduce her new staff. Thank you. Madam President, Superintendent, members of the board, it's my pleasure this evening to introduce our new teaching staff at Smoke Tree. I'd first like to introduce Tina Hetrick. Tina, are you with us this evening? The first two teachers are our developmental preschool, so that could explain why she's not here this evening. Um, Tina is originally from Pennsylvania. Her pride and joy are her two beautiful, amazing, smart, sweet little girls who are age six and three. Her interests and hobbies are running, which is going to come in handy in the preschool, <laughs> swimming, being outside, spending time with her daughters and friends, and reading and crafts. One thing she'd like to share with the district is that she has driven across the country four times. However, we're very happy she took a right turn and ended up at Smoke Preschool. <laughs> Next, our other preschool teacher is Christy Tone. Christy was born and raised in Southern California. She moved to Las Vegas, Nevada following high school graduation to pursue a career in the hotel industry. Became a wife and mother and built a successful career in marketing and special events, working for a variety of casinos. She completed her bachelor's in business management for the University of Phoenix in 2000 and graduated from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas with her master's in special education in 2002. She was very grateful to join our elementary's early childhood center. Today was her second day and she's very excited to make a difference in our students' learning, and we're very lucky to have her. Next, I'd like to introduce Brandy Peck. Brandy, would you please join me? Brandy is our new third grade teacher. She is originally from Montana, but has lived in the Parker area for 11 years. She has two daughters, Maddie, 8, and Lexi, 16. Welcome and her dad. She loves to read, buy shoes, and drive her Mustang. <laughs> One thing that she would like to share is that she's very passionate about education and works very hard to be a good teacher. We're <coughs> so excited that she chose our team to be part of that smoke trip. So thank you very much and welcome to smoke trip. <laughs> Next, I'd like to introduce Kelly Tapp. Kelly, would you please join us? Kelly this year has joined our kindergarten team. She's originally from Texas. However, she's been in Arizona for the past 19 years and the past five years on my job suit. Her hobbies are reading, being around family, and bowling. She loves teaching because she knows that she's doing her part to make the world better. 
She says the best part is seeing a student's face light up when they finally discover the concept and understand it. And I can say when I walk past her room, it's one of the brightest rooms because she has 33 kindergartners. <laughs> We're very fortunate to have her join our team. So thank you and welcome. Thank you. Next up, we'll have Mrs. Andrea Heller from Jamaica. Madam President, Superintendent, Madam members of the Governing Board, I'm, I'm very anxious and thrilled to be able to introduce my staff to you this evening. Um, I'm going to ask uh, for apologies because several of my new staff are still at the school <laughs> preparing for open house tomorrow night. As you can imagine, I do have one of my staff here, but the majority of them are preparing for a lot of uh, fundraising opportunities that we have tomorrow night. So I'm going to share a little bit about the people that we uh, brought onto our staff tonight. Our first is Miss Rachel Sandelius. Um, she's in second grade. She just moved from Central Michigan University in Mount Pleasant, Michigan. She moved to Lake Havasu, uh, Lake Havasu City this July, just right before our training started, so she's brand new to the city. Um, she's worked in various schools as support staff member all through college and did a year of development or kindergarten before moving to Arizona. She's now teaching uh, second grade, and this was her best thought about um, what she's teaching so far. She said, Every day I think to myself, for the rest of these kids' lives, I'm going to be known as their second grade teacher, which I think is a familiar thought for all of us. Um, and one of, the, I, one of the questions that I asked them was, what, what was their favorite part of being at the district and at Jamaica so far this year? And she said that I can start a conversation with pretty much anyone I come in contact with. We all are at all here for each other. So that was a really good thought. My second person to introduce would be Miss, Miss Emily Lang. She's also on our second grade team. She's from Newport, Vermont. 10 minutes from the Canadian border, and she came to Lake Havasu City in 2007 right after her high school graduation, so she's been here for a while. Her background in education began with her path to obtaining her master's degree. She did her student teaching at an international school in Greece, and she said it was an amazing experience in itself. She said it opened the door to not only experiencing cultures, but also to teaching different languages. Um, and now she's in her first year teaching. So she said her favorite thing so far, and the most overwhelming, is that she learns something new every single day. She says, all day long, I feel like I'm learning something new. She says it's a constant self-reflection and edit. She says she's always thinking, how can this be better? Which is a great thing to be asking yourself, always. She says, as, um, as a staff, she says, the best thing about Jamaica is that it's a family, and it is my family, she says. I already care so much about everyone and feel so welcomed by everyone. The support and positive outlook throughout our school is impressive and something to be proud of. So that's thankful as well. Our next teacher would be Ms. Samantha Trotter. She's our third grade team. She was born and raised in Palm Springs and went to, uh, went to college in San Diego. She moved to Havasu in January 2013 and uh, to pursue her master's degree in elementary education and has recently completed. Um, she said she always knew that she wanted to be a teacher. And, now that she's in third grade, she said she's, she never knew that this kid age could be so wonderful. She says, my favorite part about teaching this grade is how excited they are for everything we do. They are so enthusiastic. Every kid in my class has a huge heart and makes my day special every day. My favorite thing about Jamaica so far, hands down, she says, has to be the family. They immediately took me in and made me one of their own and have taken care of me every day since. I could not be successful in this journey without such a wonderful team and family to take great care of me. I'm proud to call myself a product. Um, our next um, two teachers are from our fifth and sixth grade team. I have Ms. Kay Dial with me. Kay, you want to go ahead and stand up and come on up with me? Kay comes to us from uh, New York City. She lived there for 25 years and has a background in theater as well. She got her master's degree in urban and multicultural education and has a New York t uh, City teaching certificate. She became a teacher after 9-11. And she said she visited a year ago and fell in love with Lake Havasu City. She also has family in town that she's, um, that she's here to be with as well. Um, <laughs> she said, this is her first year in our district. She says, I love the team support system here, and I truly believe it's a perfect fit for me. This is a positive and nurturing environment to work in. It is a privilege to be part of the Jamaica family. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our other um, person at fifth and sixth grade is a veteran teacher to our district, um, a person that I've watched teaching over the years and who I've come to love as well. She taught for 26 years at third and fourth grade. She also taught at Starling and she's taught at Jamaica as well. Um, she was a teacher aide 
for eight years at Nautilus while going to school to be a teacher. And she retired, she actually retired six years ago and came back to us this year um, to be part of our family. She retired when her husband became ill with cancer and she's back with our district this year. Um, she's been a Havasu resident for 32 years and uh, and I actually graduated with her daughter. Um, so it's Mary Lennart. Um, and then our last uh, addition to our team was Joan Anderson. She is our art teacher. And I'm sad to say that she's going to be in rotation soon again. Um, Joan came to us from Poland. Uh, she's taught art for several years. And she said that she's she's so excited to work with the students in this district that she's loved this, she loves the support of the district so far and just wishes she had more time to get to know the students. So we're, ex we're extremely excited to have all the members of our, our new team, and I'm just thankful that they're part of our family. So thank you. Next, we'll have Mr. Brett Bitterman from Oro Grande. They both really insisted on coming right up. So. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a great idea, uh, Madam President, members of the board. Um, I have the great privilege of introducing uh, two members to my Hora Grande team. Um, one, I had something to do with getting her here, um, which was Erica. She's teaching music. She's from Michigan, a little suburb outside of Detroit. And I always say it wrong, but it's Rochester. Rochester. Oh, it's pretty good. Um, I can tell you that. When we thought about getting her in, there was a 50-50 chance we thought that we were going to get her. Um, Mr. Wolf had something to do with um, the interview process. Um, I thought I had more of a 95 to 5 percent chance of getting her in, and she uh, she uh, graciously accepted the position here. So um, unique to that job, just so exciting when she brings uh, what she does in the classroom. The kids are excited. It's energy. Um, just love seeing what I see from her. So thank you very much. Um, Danelle, I had nothing to do with, um, <laughs> but I'm so impressed with just, they're both so young and they're both so intelligent in what they do, and it's just going to make our school better, our town better. Um, from Lake Havasu, graduate of our Knights system, and uh, graduated from Grand Canyon University. Um, when, I, when I said they're a member of our team, that's what they are, um, already just adding their time, their dedication, you can see it um, every day, you know, with our staff and what they bring to it. So, um, thank you very much for what you do. Next, we'll have Mr. Claude Sanders. Uh, are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm <laughs> Yeah, I've been all over the place at different times, so that's just how it goes. Um, Madam President, members of the board, um, Superintendent of Sire, this has been quite the interesting year. Um, what I will tell you is I have five new teachers. In the last 12 years, this is more new teachers than I've had in the last 12 years. So it has been quite the experience, and I think I did a really good job coming in right at the end because, man, I was really nervous when school started. <laughs> I'm going to start with um, Gina Bravada. Gina is a new kindergarten teacher to us. She is from Whittier, California. She has lived in Lake Havasu since 2007. Um, she is married, has one daughter, her name is Bella, and she is seven. And when she told me that she was going to bring her to school, I thought, I need to hire her. That's the way to get my numbers up. So <laughs> 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 numbers coming into our school. Okay. Um, Interests and hobbies. She likes to boat. She likes to jet ski. She likes to travel and watch her daughter compete in gymnastics and in cheer. Okay. I was a football player. Um, my children were students at that time. But you know what? I've got to know them over the years because they come to our school. And man, it's a lot of work to do cheerleading. I mean, it's really impressive. So the other thing is, she worked right on the back of our school, and I didn't ever meet her in like ten years. And she was at the new day behind us, and when she came in, and um, I'm going to get to that story later when I get to another person here. Um, I thought, wow, somebody with very young um, educational experience, and it was quite the score. And she's been doing a very good job, 
and a very challenge, kindergarten is challenging. I don't care what anybody says. Um, you know, it's very challenging, and we're very glad that she's hanging in there and that she's with us. Next. I gotta tell you about the next four because they're all from Lake Havasu. <laughs> I think they all graduated from our high school. So to be able to come through right at the end of the year and have two of them show up and two of them came back and still taught for us is just telling me something about when people say our school district, you know, we have problems and everything else. What I'm going to tell you is we have one of the best school districts there is. And I don't care what anybody says. Um, we put out a product that is wonderful. And we need to make sure everybody knows that. Okay? We have great teachers. We have great students. We have great parent support when we need it. And, you know, it just comes through. And people need to understand that. Instead of, you know, we're, we are challenged, we're challenged, we're challenged. We still do a great job on these people. So, Jody Biasucci, you guys have probably heard the name before because Biasucci's have been around forever. Um, Mrs. Biasucci, Anna is here. Anna, when I first got to the high school, I walked into her class and had to do an um, evaluation on an advanced Spanish class and couldn't even understand what she said. <laughs> Jody comes in, and Jody is on an internship program. Um, she has a bachelor's degree, has not been formally trained in education, but came in, picked it up, has been in fight and fight, we're working with everything else, and we're extremely proud that she has been in. I, you know, I can't even imagine coming in and hanging in there for the first six to eight weeks without a background and being able to keep it moving and keep it moving and keep learning and you know, keeping open to suggestions and just absorbing everything. So, Jody, basically what I'll tell you is she's from Lake Havasu. She was born here. She's married. She has two boys. <laughs> More numbers. <laughs> okay. um, her interests are scrapbooking, reading, photography, and travel. And she has great family support here in town. Um, everybody knows the rest of them that all came through our school district, and we are very glad to have you come in. Okay? Okay. Our next one is Mr. John Miller. John is another one that came in right at the end. I mean, I think that you were here three days before school started because we had an opening. And when John came in, I found he had a bachelor's degree in um, history, and I needed a social studies teacher. So he fell right into place at the time and what I'll tell you is, oh, thank God, because Mrs. Miner and I went at it, and went at it, we were looking everywhere, and to thank God somebody was up there and looked out for us, because within one week I had three openings at the school <coughs> still waiting to try to fill. Um, I think Jamaica was kind of in that situation, yeah. too. <laughs> what I will tell you, John um, is single. He has two children. He's <laughs> <laughs> single, ladies. He has two children. Okay, um, he enjoys sports, he enjoys politics, so he came to the right place. Um, but he also, his favorite thing is spending time with his children, and um, I give him a lot of credit for that. So, and the other hundred children that he deals with every day, um, and he has fit right in, and he's picked up some extra things for us, and I'm very glad that John came and works for us. My next one is Ms. Shelley Shower. I had met Shelley a couple of times and last year when we came through, she was in. She was doing some observations and all of a sudden I got um, a request for her to do student teaching. At, I don't know if it was the year before I think I met you. Mm -hmm. And I had a gentleman who wanted student teacher, so I put her in with Mr. Schindel, and she did a fantastic job, and he kept raving about her and raving about her and raving about her and said, you know, thought you'd really be stupid if you don't give her a job. And thank God she came and did student teaching with us because she fit right into that fourth grade slot that we had open. She has done a wonderful job keeping us moving. Um, Mr. Schindel has been smiles because he got a support person that he works very well with and that 
and she's even told me once in a while that she has to go in and make sure he's doing the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So I, that's what we needed. And like I said, Shelly is from Lake Havasu. She's married um, and has a one-year-old. More numbers. <laughs> and she likes crafting, reading, and swimming. So the show shower. The last one, um, if you're from Lake Havasu, you might know who she is. <laughs> this is Olivia Robinson. Um, her name used to be Mayers. Her mother is the head of the physical education department at the high school. And for most of us who have been here for a long time, we all know Donna Mayers. Um, Donna is about this tall, and same thing. When I first got here, she was the only female I was ever afraid of, I believe. <laughs> because she, was, she does a great job. She's very to the point and everything else. Olivia went to have a Supai Elementary School. Came back in. I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. Okay, so all the teachers that were there all tell me, yeah, this is great. When I first met her, I knew her, I met her at the high school. And when she came back in, I gave her an interview, what, five to six years ago? Ten. Or ten years ago. <laughs> I'm getting old. Ten years ago for one of the receptionist jobs. And she didn't need a receptionist job. She needed to go to college. And she is right where she needs to be. She needed to get that degree. She needed to come in and make sure she had a professional career going. Um, the cool part about this is when she... When I gave her the job and I told her that she didn't, we didn't have some openings, she said, well, what do they need to have? So these two, in the last week, were friends of this one. No, this one and this one were friends of this one. And she says, I got some friends with bachelor's degrees that probably would be great in the classroom and have some experience. And that's how I ended up with a full teaching staff. So what I will tell you is it was thanks to Olivia that I ended up with enough teachers to fill the classroom. <laughs> so she's would work her weight in gold. Olivia is like from Lake Havasu. She's been her, her, here her entire life. She is married. Um, she has one child, more numbers, um, and her interest in reading. And I haven't figured out, you know, some of you I'm going to have to do some work on getting you guys pumped up a little bit because if your interest is in reading, we really got to do something else. <laughs> okay. What I will tell you is this has been a very challenging year so far, but they are making it much easier. And to know that they're showing up to work, they're doing what we ask them to, and gritting their teeth and keep going, I am extremely proud to have this group of individuals working at my school. It's not always perfect, but they're giving it a shot, and uh, you know, I'm patting them on the back every minute I can. So, anyway, that's how to supervise new teaching staff. Next, we have Mr. Ruben Gonzalez of Nautilus. Good evening, uh, Madam President, uh, members of the board. Uh, it's Asi here. Uh, it is a uh, I'm humble and honored here to introduce two of uh, two great individuals that came to my staff, and uh, I wish I can say a lot more, like but, but I'm going to stay with the program here. <laughs> uh, I'd like to uh, introduce first our, our fifth grade teacher, Ms. Leah Branch. She came from uh, Escondido, California. She has uh, a daughter, Katie, who's 20 years old, and a son. Uh, Tim was 18 years old. She graduated from UC Santa Barbara with a BA in sociology. Uh, her master's uh, from uh, Pepperdine University. Uh, her, her hobbies are spending time with family and crafting. And this is her first year uh, as a classroom teacher. She worked uh, uh, at Nautilus as an education assistant and taught the uh, leadership classes at the Nautilus last year. So welcome. Sarah uh, Didion, our kindergarten teacher, came from Ontario, California. 
Uh, her family is just a mom, sister, brother, and a niece. Uh, she graduated from Cal State uh, University of Florida. And I happened to graduate from that same <laughs> university as well a long time ago. <laughs> uh, she uh, enjoys uh, swimming, running, hiking, and uh, scrapbooking. Uh, this is also her first year teaching. Uh, she enjoys swimming so much that before she became a teacher, she worked at a, a pool for seven years. Yes, thank you and welcome, guys. Last but not least, Mr. Mike Murray from Starline. Madam President, members of the board, I'm going to make this pretty short because I've been up here once already this evening. But I do want to point out, in case you had a hard time recognizing this, that our administrative team is extremely uh, interesting. <laughs> uh, interesting in a good way. Interesting in the fact that, that we have some very difficult conversations at times, and we're laser focused on students. But also on the interesting side of that, as you can see, it, we have a sense of humor, at least most of us do. So Madam President, members of the board, I'd like to request next year that I go before Claude. Yes. <laughs> and just launch us right into the agenda items. So just make that one. Um, in order for me, like Ruben said, to stay on message, I have a PowerPoint here for, uh, as I introduce um, on my staff. One is actually not here with us tonight, um, Steve Wayman. He's our music teacher new to the, well he's not new to the district, he's actually was here for many years. He recently came back to the district. Um, but he performs every Tuesday night at the Flying X. So if you ever want to go catch uh, him singing uh, in concert or with his band, he's at the Flying X on Tuesday night. So I'd like to introduce Tom Mullen, who's right here with us. Uh, hometown of Sunnington Beach, he has a five-year-old son, graduate of UCLA. Uh, this is his first year teaching, and he has hobbies of boating, dirt bike riding, and camping. And there's a nice little shot of, of Tom. As we pulled him out of the staff meeting, you could see that he's ready to go, right? And I felt that way, and all four of them have the same, the same picture here. So the next one is Sabrina Boulder. She's uh, from Hesperia, California. She's actually taught for quite a number of years. She's married, uh, has a five-year-old daughter and two-year-old son. Uh, more numbers on the five-year-old for, for Starline. Um, she's a graduate of East, uh, the University of California, Riverside, 12 years teaching experience, and she likes reading and baking. Uh, our next individual is Jennifer Bargos. She's actually right here from Lake Havasu City. She's married, has two daughters. Uh, one of which goes to my school, so again, Claude, more numbers. Uh, Grand Canyon University graduate. This is her first year teaching. She is actually a Starline alum, so she actually um, sat in probably the same chairs her kids are sitting in right now in her class. Uh, from where that Literally. Comes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious. Probably. They probably are sitting in the same chair. Uh, she's a mother, and obviously she teaches here at Starline. She likes reading, listening to music, and baking. And then we have Camille Keller. She's from North Dakota. Her parents are Galen and Tammy Keller. She has six brothers and sisters. She's a graduate from Minot State. This is her first year teaching um, in her own classroom setting. And her hobbies are traveling, wake surfing, camping, hiking, boating, arts and crafts. And she actually traveled to Spain. Spain and Europe. This summer, just before coming here to do teacher orientation. So she's a world traveler as well. And then finally, uh, Steve Wayman, who I mentioned, he's uh, originally from Pine Top. He's married, has two children, Jasmine and Austin. He's a graduate from Northern Arizona University, 14 years teaching, and he enjoys music and writing and TV. So these are my five teacher um, hires for Starline Elementary and the North Dallas Unified School District. So the next slide is just that official welcome to the Cavusu City and our school district. And we'll have our secondary folk at our next board meeting. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, yeah. 
Thank you, Gordon. And we are going to have an update on our AC Marathon. Madam President, Governor Gord, I'm going to present an update on the Arizona American test results we received recently. Before I do, I wanted to make a couple of comments on uh, some of the people that just presented their staff. It's, a, it's a, still a joy for me. I've been in education going on 28 years now. 19 of, my, uh, of those years were spent as a classroom teacher. I've been a principal and assistant principal. Now I'm at the district office level. But it's still a joy to get up, to come to work, because I get to work with these some of these amazing people. And I'm being honest with you. Um, Claude is a person that he's entertaining. But I, I can say to Claude that I have his back. And I, and I think the same to be said for me. It's that type of relationships that I have with many of the people in this room. And that's a unique um, situation for, for not all to experience that. The other thing I wanted to comment on is I think you find a community that's healthy, if you look at a healthy community, that usually has healthy schools, has a healthy police force that has a positive relationship with the community, um, and then parents that come out and care. And I think Lake Havasu is unique in that way as well. We, we, we have great parents, great kids, and we have a wonderful community. I'm glad that I'm here. So with that said, I thought I'd go back in the past a little bit just to bring everybody up to speed, where we started, some things I'm very proud of. So back in 2014, again, the state uses our test scores for labeling schools, fair or not, that was the old process. And our last report in 2014, you'll notice we had four A schools and four B schools. The cutoff is 140 points at that time. Our district missed being an A district by one point. And again, that took a lot of work. There was a lot of time and effort, training devoted to that, and our kids um, demonstrated their, their abilities on this test. So I'm very proud of that. In the meantime, we've been, since transitioned to a new test. It's called Arizona Merit. Um, it's unique to Arizona. It's based on the Arizona test blueprint, which determines the objective major, the number of items per objective, and the cognitive demand, which are listed in the parentheses for you. We've gone from Ames to Arizona Merit. There's no merit in comparing the two tests. Because they're I mean, comparing apples to oranges. Um, there's significant differences in the content of the new standards that are out. And it's no longer an exit exam for high school students. Arizona Merit, you don't have to pass to graduate anymore. But you did the Ames. So we wonder a little bit about how the students take that. But for the most part, we've done well. Um, with the NAEP and Arizona Merit Scores, I wanted to show you the difference. So the last result from our NAEP test, which is a national test, um, at random schools are selected across all 50 states, and then they compile the information. The yellow bars would say that those would be equivalent to what our students were scoring on the Ames test for the most part, on the same type of test. But the red where it says proficient, that's what we would like to see all of our students scoring. So you can see the difference between an Ames test and kind of a very, much more rigorous test, which would be the indicator on the red. And that's what Arizona Merit kind of does. So with that said, we've had to move forward, address new standards and expectations, and help teachers adjust to the expectations of those new standards. These performance levels, um, they were created to help um, identify student academic achievement. Um, these were all created by veteran Arizona teachers last summer. One of our teachers that was presented on this last fall, she's a math teacher of high school, her name is Carrie Thompson. She served on this committee that created these performance levels. There's four categories. So if you're a parent, you should have received a student report card, and it had the list of the minimally proficient down to highly proficient. 
our goal is to have every student proficient or highly proficient um, over the course of their educational career. But they, again, were set by veterinarians on the teachers. This is an example of those performance level descriptors. So you can see it's kind of hard to read, but if you notice on the left-hand side, it has a list of standards. Those are in code. So it looks like a sixth grade standard for um, reading, literature. And then if you look at the proficient level, those were the descriptors that all teachers said, these are what our students should be able to do, and we're going to hold to that. Because they didn't water it down, they raised the bar. And that requires a lot of effort, and there's going to be work to get those students to that level, but there's the descriptors. Okay. So we know what these look like, we know what to expect, and that's fair. Um, before uh, we started this journey, we supplied parents with resources that are on our district website, so we sent out a letter to parents ahead of time notifying them that these scores are going to be very different from what you're used to, because the test has changed. It's much more challenging. So we sent out a letter from the district. There were brochures made in both English and Spanish that were shared. And we have links to the Arizona Merit Resources on our website for parents. And not one principal shared with me that any parent came in with concerns. I think we did a good job of addressing their concerns. Um, and it went relatively smoothly. With that said, here are our test results from last year and this year. So you can see the comparison starting from grade 3 through 11, those grades are tested. And you can see, uh, we put on the right hand side, the growth, because I suggested that we were going to continue to grow and get better. When we had our first scores, we were disappointed a little bit, but we expected the change or the decrease in our scores because of the rigor of the test. And the format of the test, students are taking on a computer for the first time, so that is also a challenge. But you can see it across the board with the majority of these scores. And the paper, by the way, did a nice job reporting on our district scores. But you can see the growth. And in some grade levels, where you get a plus 16 or a plus 13, that's phenomenal growth in one year. That takes a lot of work. So math is next. You can see the same idea. We have tremendous growth in some of the grade levels. And again, I think the reason behind that is the articulation between grade levels. People are communicating, they're looking at data, they're helping each other. It's kind of a family approach. So with that, does anybody have any questions before I move on to the next few slides? Oh. What happened in grade 8? <laughs> uh, with regards to math? Both. Well, well, well. The, the paper addressed that, but in my, my explanation, we did have, you can see there is a decline, but uh, a percentage of our students at the middle school are taking an algebra 1 to 2 class, which is a high school level class. Um, the good news there is 96% of those students who are taking that advanced algebra 1A, 1B class, 96% were either proficient or highly proficient on the test. But those test scores weren't counted for the middle school. They were transferred somewhere else. Last That's year they were counted. Last year they should have put a yeah, they had to yeah. take both tests. This year they only had to take one, which is a change. Okay. They're, you're over testing the kids, I don't know if you are anyway. But. So that is a part of the explanation. So, And then, for whatever reason, the eighth grade level testing is like the big black hole. And kids, they don't perform well across the nation. You can look at data that suggests that the eighth grade, for whatever reason, they don't perform well. So that's the explanation we have. Other questions about that? All right, for our, for our own elementary schools, put those up for you to kind of compare and see. Each elementary school, we have the grade level cohort, so third through sixth. Next is the percentage of kids that are passing, how many were tested, uh, the student count, and then the percent passing. And in the majority of our grade levels, we have, we've gone above 50% or higher. Um, and, and the way you can look at that, we used to score 90s and 80s on the age results. But if you're getting 50 to 60% on the second go-around of a very rigorous test, that's good news because that means more, not all of our kids are passing, but they're passing a more difficult test. And that's a positive. So that's what I, I, I can believe on that. 
Yeah. How, how do the students react when they get their test scores if they're 60 percent when they're used to get 80 or 90 percent? That, how does that affect them? Any principals want to respond to that? Do you have any students that you know sort of teachers that are here? Right? So the students are given a number, not a percentage. So they're not given like an 80% score. Okay. They're given a score and they have a bar graph that shows where our, where they scored as opposed to the district and the state. In relation to our right. attention. So okay. they're either a one, two, three, or four. Right. Okay. And then it shows what the scenario is. <coughs> And most of our students were above state, so they're happy. Yeah, yeah, that's good. And this shows that exactly for the elementary schools. The black line is the state average. You can see we're, for the most part, across grade levels, we're above the state, which is the norm for Lake County State Unified School District. We're always fairly well above the state. Questions on that? I don't have a question. Um, if I can make a comment, it, it's interesting to me the pattern of our scores, particularly if you look at the elementary math, the state is really flat at fifth grade. And look at how our scores go up at fifth grade. And it's just, as you look at the pattern compared to the state, so in thinking about um, those averages, I just think that's an interesting pattern. But I also think it's significant that we scored significantly above the state across all grade levels, which you can see much more clearly on the other side. Again, 2016, 7th, and 8th grade, uh, you can see our comparison to the state of Thunderbolt and the number of students who took the test percent passing at both grade levels for both DLA and math. Grades 9 through 11. And again, this is the second year for this test, the first year that all, just all schools took the test on a computer. And again, at the high school level, there's, it's not necessarily accountability, but you wonder about the motivation for kids that no longer need to pass this test for graduating mm -hmm. on graduation. Do you think that would make a difference? Mm -hmm. I think it, it does. does make a difference. I do too. Because when I was at the high school, when we first put in the AIMS, and kids weren't required to do it. They knew they weren't required. As soon as uh, it was a requirement to graduate, they took it in a more serious approach. Yeah. It's like if you say to a junior, if you do well on this test, there's a potential payout for scholarship opportunities or whatever it might be that's a motivator, you're going to see improved performance. When there's nothing attached to it, not all of them are going to put forth an effort. Scott? With that effort piece, the way that we did address that at the high school is our math department and our English department came up with incentives for our students to perform well on this test. So when they get the test scores back, which they they are, are this Thursday, it will be in the students' hands, but the teachers now have a report that I've compiled for them. And we'll use math, for example, that if you score in that highly proficient, you get X amount towards your final this semester. So in December, they're going to get points towards their final. If you score in the proficient area, you get a little bit less towards your final, but there is an incentive that we did put in place to try to help with that, I guess, test apathy, if, if you will, of, of taking that with no, nothing at stake. And then what are we doing now that we have these results and how are we helping teachers? Um, I think, again, the teacher is the critical piece here. And where we're noticing a challenge is not only retaining teachers in this district, but the amount of effort put into training teachers and then they depart. And you have to replace those teachers with an experienced um, knowledge base, and they're facing a much more rigorous test and rigorous standards. That's a challenge. So we're, we do everything we can create a system and we build family relationships, if you will, at this, at this each site. I think teachers feel welcome. We provide them with, I think, what is called quality professional development opportunities. Um, I don't think all of them are overwhelmed the first day, first week. They feel fairly confident and prepared when they walk into the classroom. Um, and then by the end of the year, hopefully with our supports, they are reflective and consider you know, staying. That's the goal. But it's a challenge. 
mean, it's pretty obvious if you have a teacher that's in the 50th percentile of teachers, that person can move a student 15 to 20 percentage points in academic growth in one year. But if you get a teacher that's in the 20th percentile, a kid can actually lose growth. If you have two of those teachers in a year, it's very difficult to make that up. The gaps widen. So it's important that we have quality teachers. So we do a lot with that. We do a, we have a mentoring program. It's based on standards, actually. So we're trying to have a language that all teachers can relate to. Um, I think it's a very powerful program. Um, Christy Olson and Tricia Cohn. Christy Olson is a master teacher, actually by certified by the State Board of Education. She leads those professional development classes. I've attended them. There are powerful um, teachers that are there are able to share their concerns, they're able to take information back and actually apply it. They're powerful, so we've done a lot with that. The other thing I, I think I'm most proud of this is when I came over to the district office, we really didn't have a lot of opportunity for horizontal and vertical articulation district-wide. There might have been a school that did it, but for the most part that wasn't a norm. Now it is, and we, we have grade level team meetings, department meetings, where everyone is talking. They're sharing, they're helping each other, and that's a, a system piece we have in place. And then every site now, ASU has provided us with a STEM program, which connects the college. Those kids get to see an actual college professor. There's a connection on the importance of education. So, and so we have community support in that area as well. And we have three brand new principals. And again, we have turnover. Principals influence a lot of things at their site. They are important people. And we, we have a wonderful mentor. Mike is mentoring our three new elementary principals. I don't think you can find a better person for that um, job. Mike is knowledgeable, he cares, he's a difference maker, and I think he's influenced the three the principles that we have in a positive way. And we have quality people at the admin team. We talk, we share, um, we make jokes once in a while, but especially about Claude. No. <laughs> I take a shot by <laughs> um, These are the resources we have targeted for staff and students to help with the new rigor and the new standards. So I brought in thinking maps several years ago. It's pretty much throughout the district now. It helps kids with their thinking and metacognition. For the first time, we actually have a grammar scope and sequence. Right, Jenny? Right. <laughs> so that's grades K all the way through 9. And um, I was in a classroom over at Smoke Tree this past week. And I believe I was with three of the other directors. And they saw some teachers utilizing this grammar scope and sequence in the training they went through. And they were teaching grammatical concepts with confidence and were loving it. And you could see all of the kids were using the language and understanding it. And their writing, their writing skills are going to increase tremendously as a result. Anybody in here want to have a comment that's a teacher that's using this by chance? Anyone at all? Okay. Um, I really do love it. Um, the kids are also really enjoying it and the academic vocabulary that it brings in. Sorry, I'm sorry. They are using the words like pre present progressive, past progressive. They're writing sentences and using a formula. It breaks it all down and it, it is less than the two, so I do enjoy it. So. We have a, a thing called Right from the Beginning and Beyond where we're helping teachers understand how to help kids understand literature and inform informational text, et cetera, um, questioning involved in that. And we're all using the same techniques, which is helpful. And then we have been doing QAR and close reading for many years. Those are reading strategies that are very successful with kids. Mm -hmm. And this is an example. I just wanted to share this about something I'm very proud about. I shared this last year, but I thought I'd pull it up again. This is a letter or memo, if you will, typed by a first grade teacher to her grade level team members, that's all first grade teachers throughout the district, had an articulation meeting that she was going to host. She shared what they should be bringing to the meeting, what she wanted them to be focused on, the reflection involvement here. And this was not mandated by me. This is something she volunteered to do and cares, you can see in her response. So it's exciting. Um, we have a new superintendent. and. 
first thing I noticed is she came in and she did not ask us to do anything new. Because I'm sure that was a concern for some people, is, uh oh, we're going to have things flipped upside down. But what she's done is she's asked us to think strategically, to look at what we're doing and really focus on the things we can do better or that we're doing really well and continue to do those things. And then we would support one another in, on this journey we're on. So it's been nice to work with Diana. Um, she's allowed us to think, to share, and has asked each of us to grow and really target what we're doing at our sites. And then my, my, one of my main callings, if you will, is I'm supposed to eliminate programs that are not working, avoid redundancy, and look at things that are working that we get a return on investment. I don't have a lot of money to spend. I have a lot of people that approach me to try to sell me things. It's part of the common core. And I usually listen, but I don't buy. I want to, I want to have things that are vetted, that are research-based or validated, that really will help us grow collectively. So that's kind of what I do is a lot of my time is make sure I'm not being buffaloed, if you will. And that is my presentation. Thank you. City Education Association. Carol? Yeah. Certainly just standing. Well, yeah. All right, Madam President, board members, Superintendent Sire, and directors. Wow. Um, so it's almost the end of the first quarter. <laughs> and I um, just wanted to shed some light on the last month, September 8th. Um, we hosted a welcoming event for our new staff classified and certified to celebrate their first month Woo -hoo, they made it. Um, with the district. Unfortunately, not everybody was able to make it, but those that did uh, seem to enjoy it. Um, we began at small cakes, staff engaged in a little activity, and then that led to a selfie scavenger hunt challenge. Uh, the staff set out to a low key local businesses that have given support to Lake County Students High School District uh, through donations that they gave us um, gift cards and uh, prizes for different events. Uh, we finalized uh, the event with some drawings and those that showed up walked away with uh, some handsome gifts um, about, it ranged from about $50 to $100 depending on what you chose. Right, John? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Let's see here. Uh, oh, for the new teachers that are still here that didn't make it, you're looking for something um, in your inner district mail because I will be sending you something um, for another chance to because we still have some items left. Um, so for you, have a chance to actually uh, get a price. Uh, something that I know most of us as educators are aware of, but maybe not the public altogether or students that I see that are in the room. Um, the Arizona State Department has just released the first draft of SF, which is the Every Student uh, Succeeds Act. It is requested by the Arizona State Department that we collectively review this and take the survey. There are about eight questions in the survey. Question one and two, I enjoy responding to. Question one, if you could tell the federal government one thing about Arizona education, what would it be? Mind you, I had to submit a couple of times because it said one. Um, second question, if you could tell Arizona state government one thing about Arizona education, what would it be? And again, I definitely responded there. And I encourage you all to do the same. Questions three through eight were regarding the pieces of the draft that were about standards, assessment accountability, school improvement, educator support, and student support. And I know, I was going to follow Mr. Gardner, this presentation about the Arizona Merit Scores. It is great that we are increasing and I expect this to continue. But I truly hope that that's not solely how we are choosing to view our schools in our district. 
We have fantastic paintings going on in our schools and our classrooms. And even though the state puts as much emphasis as it does on those scores, I hope as a district, a community, we are able to look beyond the numbers and see our students for who they are as individuals and continue to work on the whole child and not just these numbers. Because as we know, with high stakes comes high stress. And Mr. Gardner, I want to say thank you. I don't know if everybody um, received your email today, but Mr. Goodman sent it uh, regarding Galileo, and that relieved a lot of stress at our building. And uh, so thank you regarding that. So with all that said, I want, I can't encourage you all, everybody in this room and the community, to go to www.azed.gov backslash ESSA backslash and review the draft <coughs> and submit your survey. Um, oh, and one last push, October 1st, Menchart. Okay. Only orchids, save our schools, go to registration. If you're registered, great, come. If you're not, definitely come. <laughs> So, Mr. Gordon, what are we talking about with Galileo? Because I was not aware of that. <laughs> um, what Carol was referencing is we are transitioning to computer based testing throughout our district. We have limited resources at every site. We have a computer lab at one elementary school that actually has over 600 students. So, that's one lab. And what happens with Galileo? Galileo is our assessment tool we use to help us look at where students are in these benchmarks that are based on the Arizona standards, college and career standards. So we're all teaching the standards and then we do an assessment to see if our kids are growing, if they're learning what they're supposed to learn. And we use that information to make some decisions at the classroom site level and possibly at the school level. Um, so with the transition from paper testing to computer testing, there's some logistics that, this, that, the, that, have, that are creating challenges. For example, Mike at Starline, he's got, we test first through sixth grades, not just three through sixth grade on Galileo. So to get his kids into a computer lab for 40 to 50 minutes for ELA and math two times, and have all of those students somehow get into the lab, it's, it's not realistic if I have a 40 question test. So we're trying to shrink the test a little bit. It'll still be valid. We're still focused on the standards, but people are a little nervous right now that, again, we're looking at these things and we're trying to accommodate and be realistic and support staff members. So remember the idea about retention? We're not trying to stress people out. It's still a powerful tool, and I'm not saying we don't use this. That's not the message that I sent out there. We're going to use it, but we want to use it wisely and help people get to the point where it's not a stressor, but we can make this work in the two weeks of a window that we have. So that's what that's all about. And it lowered the stress level, in my opinion. And we're still using the, the tool. Okay. Thanks. Yep. You had a question? No, I just wanted to piggyback on what Carol had said about the, the Every Student Succeeds Act and the survey. Uh, you know, Diane Douglas had put out a plan. Um, students can't, Arizona students can't afford to wait, 158 page plan. But what's interesting in the uh, ESSA, the ESSA application, is that she color co coordinated it. So she has in one color what the feds are expecting out of ESSA, and then she's got her color co coordinated to her plan that she had put out last year. So it's nice that. So I just encourage everybody to, to read through that. And it's, uh, she's a big proponent of teachers, and, and I know that she's trying to help the teachers. So hope everybody reads that and takes the survey for yeah, us. I, I will actually send out the survey to everyone tomorrow. Oh, good. Yeah. Good. Thank you. OK, um, move on to quotes of the public. Terry, do we have any? No, we have none. Okay, thank you. Then we'll move on to action items. 3.1, approval of the consent calendar. Could I have a motion to approve, please? I move that we approve the consent calendar. Second. Second. Any questions or comments? Terry? 
Pat Rooney? Yes. Ann Caranoni? Yes. Nicole Cohen? Yes. Roger Schmidt? Yes. Joe Gamaretta? Yes. Item uh, 4.1 on the roll of business, second presentation and review of the revised policy KF community use of school facilities. Thank you, Madam President, members of the board, it's recommended that the board approve the second presentation of the revised policy KF community use of schools. This um, first reading already went through. We have not made any changes to this policy. Okay, thank you. Do you have a motion to approve? I make a motion. We approve 4.1 as presented. Second. Any questions or comments? Gary? Nancy Anononi? Yes. Nicole Cohen? Yes. Roger Smith? Yes. Pat Rooney? Yes. Joe Navarretta? Yes. Okay, and then we'll move to action items. Uh, item 5.1, approval of Lake Havasu High School National Honor Society members travel to a leadership event in Denver, Colorado. Jenny Sautner. Good evening, Madam President, members of the board. Um, for this action item, I brought tonight my, our National Honor Society President, Casey Olson, and she's going to speak to you. Madam President and members of the governing board, my name is Casey Olson, and I'm the National Honor Society President at the high school. The weekend of November 11th through the 13th, myself, the other eight executive members, and Ms. Madeline Gomez as our chaperone, would like to travel to Denver, Colorado for the LEAD conference. Whereat we will sharpen our leadership skills to improve school, culture, and community while networking with peers across the country. Are there any questions? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do I have oh, well, first of all, we need a motion, then we can have a question. To make a motion, we approve 5.1 as presented. Second. Okay. Roger. Any question? You're going to a city that has a rather unusual reputation. Of a, of a significant amount of drugs. How are you going to prevent that? Or prevent somebody trying to sneak? Right. Um, because it's a small number of students, we're just taking the National Honor Society executive members. Um, and it's a really controlled environment. We'd be going from the hotel to the conference center, um, staying there at, like on site, and then leaving. I don't foresee any problems, but I understand your concern, and I think the chaperones are really aware of that situation. So just is one chaperone? Um, on that trip, yes, because of the ratio. Yes, oh, it's, I it's, yeah. it's less than 10 students, and then it's like a, the burden to bear on the club to pay for that additional chaperone. Is there, is there any, um, uh, I'm going to use the term free time, go do whatever you want? Um, no. <laughs> Not really. no. That's a good. No, we don't we don't just like let the students run amok in the city. We, so if there is time between conferences, like the last time that we went to the lead conference, we had a breakout session where we actually hosted one of them and talked about our day of service and then we taught that to other students across the country. <coughs> so we primarily stayed in the hotel and like, prepared to do that. So, okay. yeah, so if there was any free time that we'd be out of the conference center, the chaperone would still be with them. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Terry? Nicole Cohen? Yes. Roger Schmidt? Yes. Pat Rooney? Yes. Nancy Agnoni? Yes. Joe Navarrete? Yes. Okay, item 5.2, approval of Lake Havasu High School National Honor Society travel for student leadership training in Anaheim, California. We also plan on traveling to Anaheim, California for the Youth Education Series in Disneyland theme parks the weekend of March 3rd through the 5th, where our general members will have the opportunity to le learn leadership skills and how to apply them to real-life situations and prepare for a successful future. Any questions about that trip? I make a motion that we approve 5.2 as presented. Second. Any questions? No, but you're a great speaker. Great eye contact. How many? How many students? For this trip, it would be 40. So we generally take 40 students, and then we again take the chaperone number to meet that ratio, so we'd have four chaperones on that trip. Great. Any other questions? Terry? 
Roger Smith? Yes. Pat Rooney? Yes. Nancy Anoni? Yes. Nicole Collins? Yes. Joe Navaretta? Yes. Okay, item 5.3, approval of Lake Havasu High School student government travel for graduating seniors to Anaheim, California. Yes. Yeah. Um, what we're asking is for you to approve some out-of-state travel to reward our graduating class uh, by taking them to Disney grad night. We would be doing that. The date is to be determined sometime in May before their graduation so that they are still students at Lake Havasu High School. And we typically take two buses of 80 students. Again, the number of chaperones would vary based on exactly how many students that we took. And those students self-fund so they pay for it, but student government runs it and organizes the trip for them. Is it 80 per bus? 40 per bus, so 40. typically two buses. And that means eight chaperones? Yes, I actually think Disney chaperone standards are higher, so I believe it's even more chaperones. So say that again? I think the, the standards for Disney, for Disney grad night, they ask for more chaperones. Oh, okay. So we send even more. There will obviously be some free time here. If and I that, use that term. Yes, that is absolute. That is all free time. So when they get off the bus, we get we hand them their ticket to Disneyland, and then they go to Disneyland until the time is over. But I make a motion we approve 5.3. Second. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Gary. Pat Bernie. Yes. James Dunnie. Yes. Nicole Cohen. Yes. Roger Smith. Yes. Yes. I'll just make a comment because I remember when um, you and your sister were in high school. <laughs> yes. And uh, there was a, the big thing was to have student trips without chaperones. And people would con they were soliciting the, the, I don't know if they're still doing that, they were soliciting the student government to sponsor it, but there were no chaperones because it wasn't a school sponsored. Thing. And so I think this is awesome because it's nice to give the students an outlet that is chaperone and it is condoned by the school. So I appreciate you doing that. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. So 5.4 approval of intergovernmental agreement between Western Arizona. Uh, vocational Education District Number 50 and Lake Havasu Unified School District Number 1. Yes, Madam President, members of the Governing Board, before I touch on 5.4, I'd like to add to what Jenny just went on that grad trip. When you think about teachers caring and going out of their ways and kids have an experience in their life, this group of teachers who go with chaperones, they leave on that day, on a bus with the kids. Imagine. They go to Disneyland the entire time with the students. They leave Disneyland at 2 a.m. that morning. So they not only get up early to get on a bus with these students and travel five hours to Anaheim, spend the entire time at Disneyland and 2 a.m. way past my bedtime, and stay up till 2 a.m. to chaperone and then get on a bus for another five hour drive back home to re return home at 7 a.m. I think is a huge testament to our teachers. Absolutely. Madam President, uh, members of the Governing Board, <coughs> it is recommended the Governing Board approve the intergovernmental agreement between Lake House Unified School District Number 1 and the Western Arizona Vocational Education District Number 50. The purpose of the agreement is to establish term and conditions under which WAVE will provide joint technological educational courses at satellite locations in the Hobby County including the Gutsu Unified School District number one. Um, this has been submitted to the board as well and has been approved. I make a motion to approve 5.4 presented. Second. 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 Okay, item 5.5, first presentation and review of revised policy JC school attendance areas and uh, KB parental involvement in education. And 
Thank you, Madam President. We recommend that the board approve the first presentation of policy JC school attendance and KB parental involvement. These are recommendations based on changes to um, the education statutes, and so these policies have been revised to align with the statutory language. Do I have a motion to approve? I move that the board approve action item 5.5 as presented. Sure. Any questions or comments? Comment. I just want to make the comment that I think it's um, odd that we have to uh, legislate parental involvement in our schools. That's all. Um, and I'll, I'll make another comment. I went to a, a one of the breakout sessions when we were down at that conference. And one of the one of the sessions was about mandatory parental involvement and how um, not the public K twelve schools can do that, but that um, charters, charters can do that, and they have a contract that they have the parents sign that they it is a mandatory thing that they have so many hours service hours, and if not, they that next year they don't allow the student back. It's really interesting that they're having, actually having to do that. So, Ms. President, um, I just want to clarify that you are accepting the optional language that's on page three as part of that motion. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And I think you need that by the. Who made the motion? I didn't. Did, did I, I make the motion? Yes. Oh, oh, Nancy did. Oh, oh Nancy. So you're including the optional, yes, and who did the second? I have Roger. Roger. I'm sorry. The optional language, are you okay with that? Yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Terry. All right. Let me go for the vote, please. Yes. Nicole Cullen? Yes. Patrick Smith? Yes. Pat Rooney? Yes. Nancy Ionone? Yes. Joe Navarrete? Yes. Okay. Um, 5.6, first presentation and review of revised policy JICI weapons in school and KFAA smoking on school premises or public functions. So sorry. Madam President, members of the board, we recommend that you approve these policy revisions based on changes again in the Arizona revised statute. The weapons policy clarifies that the schools cannot enforce um, restrictions on carrying a weapon on a public right-of-way by a person who has the authority to carry that weapon. And then the second one is actually the deletion of the smoking because Arizona is now a smoke-free state. Okay, thank you. Do we have a motion to approve? I make a motion. We approve 5.6 as presented. Okay. Any questions or comments? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I do have a what question. is what is the permission? I mean, I understand a police officer in that, but are we talking about somebody who um, goes down and gets a, conceal, a three hour concealed gun permit? Is that would that also right? Be but the, it's on the right the right away, so it's not on off school property. Oh, okay. It would so be if they were parked out on the street. Yeah, yeah. If they put it in their glove box. Yeah. yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, the question I have is, you know, I can understand a CCW person having the authority, but in the state of Arizona, you don't have to have a CCW to carry a weapon. Can, anybody can carry one, anytime, within the law. Mm -hmm. Right. That's basically, yes, what they're telling you. So basically, anybody can have, in the right-of-way, a weapon in their vehicle or on their body or whatever. Correct. Okay. Terry? Pat Rooney? Yes. Nancy Arnone? Yes. Nicole Collin? Yes. Dr. Schmidt? Yes. Joe Navarretta? Yes. Okay, item 5.7, first presentation and review of revised policy LC relations with education research agencies. Sorry. Yes. This is a revision of our existing policy on education with, uh, excuse me, on the uh, relations with educational research agencies, and this adds a statement that we will comply with the law, uh, the statute in relation to Arizona Revised Statute 15-117, and um, our own board policy in that area, which will come up at a later date. 
Okay. So, and I guess there was a question. I'll let you speak to it. Uh, wait. I was just going to make a motion that we that table, we table this All right, so that just go action ahead item. And do that because of the relation to the other item. Right. So. Correct. Okay. So go ahead. Make a motion. I just did. Keep oh, it. I'm sorry. Second. <laughs> go ahead. Carrie? Okay, Yes. Yes. Roger Smith? Yes. Pat Yes. Joe Yes. Okay, I 5.8, first presentation, a review of revised policy, JJJ, extracurricular activity eligibility. Thank you. We do recommend that the board approve this policy on first presentation. This revises the, the extracurricular activity eligibility to align with the Arizona revised statute that the um, governing board or other authorities in an athletic activity may not prohibit a pupil from wearing a religious or cultural accessory or hairpiece while participating in the activity as long as it is not deemed unsafe. Okay, I have a motion. Make a motion we approve 5.8 as presented. Second. Any questions or comments? I have a question on uh, page one of three where and the uh, First thing under A, where it says um, students who, upon uh, having their work uh, work checked on on a cumulative basis at the end of each one week period, show that they are not working in capacity and have one or more failing grades, will be removed from any athletic teams or extracurricular activities. Does that mean they can't go to practice? No. They can still go to practice, but they cannot participate. Is that correct, Scott? I'm correct. sorry. Okay, I just wanted a clarification on that because when it Does says removed from I, any athletic... Because I haven't seen that wording. I don't. I didn't read through it all. Because... We, don't, we do not remove them from a team. They practice all week still. They participate in all the team's okay, functions. Okay, because you, you take them out of practice, you, you're going to have a liability problem because they're not practicing. Mm -hmm. But I just uh, would question... The, the, way, the way it's written it will be removed from out. any athletic teams, it says mm -hmm. here. I think we need to adjust that language. I do too, because uh, the thing is, that, that's folly if you... I don't have a problem that the kid can't compete, because that's what they want to do. And, and no kid wants to go to practice all the time and not compete. But if you, if, if you don't let them go to practice, uh, there's a liability issue when a kid gets back out there. Absolutely. So how do we make sure that that's in there? Well, do we want to say removed from participating in any regularly scheduled games or? Interscholastic uh, competition. There you yeah. go. Yeah, that, that's what I would put in there. Mm -hmm. And we've always had it at the high school that you can practice, but you cannot compete. Okay, so we will be removed from participating in any interscholastic competition. Yeah, because would, that doesn't preclude them from practice, though. Exactly. Did you catch that, Terry? I just think it's prudent to do that. Okay. So we are... We made our motion. You want to withdraw your second? Withdraw it and just restate it? We can do that. Just withdraw it, it's easier. <laughs> Okay. You second it, so you withdraw first. Okay, I'll withdraw first. I withdraw my motion. Okay, so now let's go oh. for a new motion. I make a motion that we approve 5.8 with the stipulation that students uh, may still practice upon having their work checked on a cumulative basis. All right. We have a second. Second. Okay. <laughs> so basically use the verbiage that we... That we Talked about. Okay. From participating in any interscholastic competition. Interscholastic competition. Right. Sorry. Is there a second? That's okay. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, there was. Okay. Jerry? Nicole Cullen? Yes. Roger Smith? Yes. Nancy Anoni? Yes. Pat Roney? Yes. Nicole Navaretta? Yes. Okay, 5.9, first presentation, a review of revised policy, JFABD, admission of homeless students. Mr. Gardner. Madam President, Governing Board, it is recommended the Board approve the first presentation of revised policy, JFABD, admission of homeless students. For Arizona School Board's Association Policy Services Advisory is dated July 2016. The following policy revisions are being presented. Policy advisory number 557. Policy JFABD, Admission of Homeless Students. ARS 15-816, 
2.01 has been revised by HB 2665 to allow school districts to give enrollment preference to children who are in foster care and to allow charter schools as authorized in, a, in an addition to ARS 15-183 to give enrollment preference to children who are in foster care or meet the definition of unaccompanied youth prescribed in the McKinney Vento Homeless Assistance Act. I have a motion. We approve 5.9 as presented. Second. 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 How many homeless students do we have in our school district? I don't have a number, but we do have homeless students, yes. Okay. I just wondered if it was a big problem here. I thought it was. It is a problem. Okay. 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 Any Anything else? Very good. Nicole Cohen? Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay, item 5.10, first presentation and review of new policy, JRR student surveys. Um, I, need a motion to I make a motion that we table 5.10 while we work on the language of our policy of the second. Okay. Terry? Yes. Pat Rooney? Yes. Nancy Yes. Nicole Cohen? Yes. Yes. 5.11, first presentation and review of revised policy JLCD medicines, administering medicines to students. Madam President, members of the board, it is recommended that the board approve the first presentation of revised policy JLCD medicines, administering medicines to students. For Arizona School Board Association Policy Services Advisory, in July 2016, the policy is being revised and is presented. Um, House Bill 2355 expanded the general powers and duties of the governing board, which now includes the requirement, ARS 15341, A, Section 43, that the governing board shall prescribe and enforce policies and procedures for the emergency administration of naloxone, hydrochloride, or any other opiate antagonist approved by the United States Food and Drug Administration by an employee of a school district pursuant to Section 362267. Administration of opioid antagonist exemption of civil liability definition, which is part, states the following. A person may administer the opioid antagonist that is prescribed or dispensed pursuant to Section 32, 1979, or 362266 in accordance with the protocol specified by the physician nurse practitioner, pharmacist, or other health professionals to a person who is experiencing an opioid-related overdose, a person who is in good faith and without <coughs> compensation administers an opioid antagonist to a person who is experiencing an opioid-related overdose is not liable for any civil or other damages as a result of any of the act or omission by the person rendering the care or as the result of any act or failure to act to arrange for further medical treatment or care for the person experiencing the overdose. Unless the person while rendering the care acts with gross negligence, willful misconduct, or intentional wrongdoing. For the purpose of this section, the person includes any employee of a school district or charter schools acting in the person's official capacity. I move that we approve 5.11. We have a second. Second. Any questions or comments? I just have one question, and it's just for clarification, because in the first part of the policy, it says that the governing board shall prescribe policies, but then when it goes to the second paragraph, and it says, it says a person may administer, so are we forced to keep that on our campuses and administer? No, what it's saying here is that by law, you have to have a policy that allows for it. If you don't have it, obviously, you're not going to be you administering it. But they have not put anything in and provision at this time, like they did the EpiPens, that additional funding may be available. Okay. I just wanted to make that. At this time, they have not. And the other thing is that in the explanation, it's talking about holding homeless the employee who's actually doing it. But then what about the school district itself? I mean, it doesn't say anything about the yeah. school district. And it's going back to the Good Samaritan law and looking at that piece that if you're acting in good faith, does it we do have children who may be going through some different treatments with cancer, chemo, and sometimes they may be taking prescribed pain medicine that requires, that, that could be a concern based on their health. They may, if the doctor may make that available in case the medication and may have an adverse reaction 
and it may be kind of a more of a preventative piece. Um, but as you know, what's been going on nationally is they are prescribing this. Police officers are walking, have them in their cars and things like that because heroin addiction is a, it's a growing problem in our nation. Uh, what, I guess my question here is, you know, the district might have right. 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 It doesn't say that. So, I mean, are we opening ourselves up? I mean, so, so what, are, what about our liability? It's a state legislation mandate that the district has to have that policy. So, I think from a state perspective, having policy isn't going to open it up. If we were to store them and have it available and it's an option, then you could possibly do that versus having a student come in with a prescription and it's their medication. We have a um, record, a release, a parent. So that would be the piece if we were to look at it being proactive and having it available like an EpiPen. There could be the potential. I still don't feel comfortable because we're saying well, we're holding our employee homes, but we're not, the district is not. I mean, why? Melissa, you've read enough of these. I would just you? add that basically any time you have a school district, you're taking responsibility for things. What Aggie is saying that if the person doing it, you know, isn't going to be held liable because they're thinking in Good Samaritan terms or whatever. But the school district, you're not going to avoid any liability ever. I mean, anybody has a right to sue you all the time. Well, yeah. If we were going to begin keeping it or purchasing it and keeping it, would, would, would it then come back before the board or is that something that would be, that decision would be made administratively? Well, I can't imagine we would purchase it and keep it. This is if somebody's bringing you a prescription and then you administer it. And we don't just mm. buy this stuff. The only thing that's in statute right now <clears throat> is, is EpiPens being that the legislature has said in the event that they provide additional funding that you have to purchase that and then you have to put in place the training and have it available. That's the only thing on record regarding being a mandated to have medication piece. No, I understand that, but isn't this uh, naloxone? So, That's an injectable. Right, so in, your question would be, would it come back to the board? Right. Yes, it would. So it's yes. not a concern right now because it would come back to the board before we would make that decision. That's all I was saying. Yes. Because she was concerned about liability. Liability. Right. Okay. Really, pardon my ignorance, but what's an opioid antagonist? If you take a heroin or morphine, for example, morphine is a, is a controlled form of heroin through medicinal practices. Um, it is to prevent an overdose of either heroin or a narcotic that is a derivative of heroin as a basis. So if you, which is the if you have something that's a potential overdose, the antagonist will, will slow it down. offset that. Or it's like an EpiPen, um, if you want to think about that, will reverse heroin. those reactions and, and help to kind of control like an allergic reaction. The EpiPen stops it and reverses some of that. It actually blocks the effects of the opioids. Okay. And the term antagonist is like you would think it's a fighter, it fights it. Thank you. Anything else? Terry? Nancy Androni? Yes. Nicole Cohen? Yes. Roger Smith? Yes. Pat Rooney? Yes. Bill Navarrete? Yes. Um, 5.12, first presentation and review of revised policy IKF graduation requirements. Roger. Madam President, the board has recommended that the board approve the first presentation of revised policy IKF graduation requirements. Per Arizona School Board Association Policy Services Advisory is dated July 2016. The following policy revisions are being presented. Policy Advisory Number 555, Policy IKF graduation requirements. Senate Bill 1239 added ARS 15 258 to Title 15 Education. This section directs the superintendent of public instruction to establish a state civil of biliteracy program to recognize students who graduate from a school operated by a school district or a charter school located in this state and who have attained a high level of proficiency in one or more languages in addition to English. School districts or charter schools may voluntarily participate in the state civil of biliteracy program by notifying the superintendent of public instruction of such intention. Schools will then identify the students who have met the requirements to be awarded the state civil by literacy, which shall be affixed to the diploma and noted on the transcript of each student who has met the requirements. Okay, thank you. Do we have a motion to approve? I move that we approve 5.12 as presented. Second. Any questions? Or on comments? this by literacy program, does that mean you have to be enrolled like in a Spanish class and all that? You have to. What if you're a multilingual anyway? 
Well, you have to show proficiency on some type of exam to, to, and I'm not sure what the proficiency status is. I don't think that's been established yet. Okay. So you don't have to uh, necessarily be enrolled in the class to be uh, biliterate, right? Well, in our high school, we only offer Spanish, but they have opportunities to take some additional courses online. But, you know, I don't know the, what the proficiency is or okay. the requirements. They haven't come up with that. Not that I'm aware of. Interesting. Another test? Yeah. yeah. But it is, it, it is. Do you know what I'm saying, Claude? Because a kid can come into school and they may know another language and all of a sudden he says, I'm a multi, you know, I'm multilingual, I can speak. But, uh, so that's why I was asking, are they going to have to take a test, uh, take so many courses, but you don't know. The requirements have not been established. Uh, it would be, though, something that I think for a student to accomplish this, if the requirements are legit, to have that on their diploma, that, that's important. Mm -hmm. If I'm bilingual, my job opportunities are going to be increased. Yeah. Wouldn't they have that on a transcript? You see what, I, what I'm driving at? If you've taken uh, language classes, you have that on a tri transcript. Now we have a seal for biliteracy. I don't know. Maybe uh, maybe the world's getting too cl complicated, or maybe we need a seal for everything. That's all I'm saying. You see what I'm saying? I do. But I think this would identify a student who is actually proficient based on these requirements. I'm thinking it's probably going to be some kind of testing because... Because I can say, when I was in Spanish at my high school freshman year, I could say five words and would that mean that I'm proficient at the end? I don't think so. Okay. Right. Be interesting. Because I know of jobs where you, you could say you're bilingual, but you have to prove it by taking a test to show that you're proficient in whatever area you've been using it. Yeah. So, in by literacy, typically it requires a writing sample in that language uh, on demand. And my, I, I would anticipate the state would model it after other states, which is where the student demonstrates in an oral interview their verbal and then in an on demand writing sample their written ability to get the seal. So. This is yet again the state makes a policy and a law, and then they don't have the. How so, do it, it is voluntary for districts to participate. Mm -hmm. Um, anybody else? Terry? Nicole Cullen? Yes. Roger Schmidt? Yes. Pat Rooney? Yes. Mark Giannone? Yes. Bill Navaretta? Yes. 5.13, approval of administrative performance pay plan and criteria for the 2016-2017 uh, school year. Okay. Actually, we're tabling that. We're tabling. We're request to table that yeah. one. Okay, so we have a motion to table that one. I move that we table 5.13. Second. Okay. Um, Terry? Pat Rooney? Yes. Mark Giannone? Yes. Bill Navaretta? Yes. Mark Giannone? Yes. Roger Schmidt? Yes. Bill Navaretta? Yes. 5.14, approval of two, uh, 2017 capital plan to be submitted to the school facilities board. Okay, Madam President, members of the board, it's recommended the governing board approve the district's capital plan for the fiscal year 2017. This is an annual report that we submit to the Arizona School Facilities Board, and um, it reflects if we are asking for any new um, buildings to be built for growth purposes, and we are not. Okay. Do we have a motion to approve? I move that the board approve action item 5.14 as presented. <coughs> Second. Second. Any questions? Terry? Nancy Anaroni? Yes. Nicole Cohen? Yes. Roger Schmidt? Yes. Pat Rooney? Yes. Yeah. Joe Navaretta? Yes. 5.15 Approval of Public Consulting Group, uh, Inc., Medicaid Direct Service um, Claiming and Administrative Claiming Program. Madam President, members of the board, it's recommended that the governing board approve a one year, 12 month participation agreement between the Cavity Unified School District and the Public Consulting Group, also known as PCG. The agreement is from July 1st, 2016 through June 30th, 2017, and will automatically renew every 12 month period until one of the agreed upon changes occur in the stated agreement. The agreement is for the district to continue to participate in both the Medicaid Administrative Claiming Program and the Medicaid Direct Service Claiming Program, as we have in the past. PCG is the agency that the state has gone out to contract, and if you wish to participate, 
in that program, we don't have an option. This is an environment <coughs> piece, and they get paid as a percentage of the billable pieces. And it has been reviewed by five people. Thank you. A motion to approve. I'm going to we approve 5.15 as presented. Second. Any questions or comments? Is it normal to have an agreement that renews automatically unless someone makes a change every 12 months? It's not a normal practice, but because really it's their their contract with the department with the state access Medicaid program. So as they renew their program, if there's a change, until the state makes an action, but it is a terminated one, and every so many years they do have to renew. Okay. They just went through a process of renewal. Okay. Terry. Yes. 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 Item 5.16, first presentation review of revised policy KCD and exhibits KCDEA and KCDEB public gifts and donations to schools. Okay, Madam President, members of the board, it's recommended that the board approve the first presentation of the revised policy KCD public gifts and donations to schools and the exhibits KCD-EA and KCD-EV. Um, there are so many different forms of uh, receiving donations now with crowdsourcing needing to be a policy. We've come up with this particular one. It covers um, the crowdsourcing as mentioned that it puts into policy or begins the policy process of what staff have to do in order to get um, this approved by the board. using the contract, and I think you all received one of those, as far as the, co the governance of that. It is totally um, governed by the state's requirements for um, nutritional food services, timers. Um, it's not based solely on price, and that way um, we can use the best advantage to the district for those type of services. Okay, motion to approve. Somebody make a motion? I move that the board approve action item one. Five point one seven is presented. Second. Okay. Anybody have a question or comment? Okay, Terry. Yes. 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 Nicole Cohen. Yes. Roger Smith. Yes. Joe Navarrete. Yes. Five point one eight approval and renewal of uh, CES Education Inc. Arizona School Medicaid <coughs> Direct Service Agreement. Mrs. Walton. Madam President, and Mrs. Walton. Is recommended that the governing board approve the renewal of the amended Arizona School Medicaid Direct Service Agreement for CES Education for Medicaid and the Public Schools Billing Services. Attached is the revised contract for the 16 17 school year. The district participates in the Medicaid and the Public School Program, and this agreement is for the monthly billing services for the direct services that are reimbursed to the district. Our district has chosen to bill at a reduced rate to lessen the risk of paid back to access at the end of each annual cost data reporting cycle that takes approximately two years to complete. CE's education is on the same contract that was recently renewed and amended accordingly. 
and this has been reviewed by legal. This is the agency that we use that helps us to actually do our monthly submitting for us to get reimbursed. Thank you. I have a motion to approve. Make a motion we approve uh, 5.18 as presented. Sure. Any questions? Chair? Bill Cohen? Yes. Roger Schmidt? Yes. Nancy Iononi? Yes. Pat Rooney? Yes. John Navaretta? Yes. Okay, on the informational reports, uh, 6.1 transportation report. Yes. Sorry. Yes, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, as questions have arisen, um, one of the things that we've decided to do is put information in the board packet so that everybody can see it and so that it's here for the public. So what we have here is the list of district vehicles and these are, um, we have the district ID number, the year that the vehicle was purchased, the mileage on the vehicle, the model, and it also has a description of the use. So that uh, you can see that our vehicle range, depending on the type of vehicle, is all noted here and um, the mileage of some of our vehicles. We know that these questions have come forward and so the answers are here. Item 6.2 is an information item again on uh, questions that have been coming up about how we are paying for certain projects and some of the work that is being seen in the public. And Terry is passing out the uh, attachment since that was not ready in time for the actual agenda. I believe the board members have this. The, the listing uh, first page is the adjacent ways projects that we have used, or excuse me, that we have done. And this particular <coughs> list shows for 1516 the projects that were done with adjacent ways. And if, uh, if you recall, adjacent ways is restricted dollars, they are tax-based dollars, and they can only be used for asphalt and paving projects in areas that provide access to school buses or emergency vehicles on school premises. And so um, during the 15-16 year, you can see here that there was $880,000 worth of asphalt <coughs> projects that were done that were paid for through adjacent ways. Uh, that is the only thing it can be spent on. Have a Supai Star Line, uh, Lake Havasu High School, and the district transportation areas were addressed. And for 15, excuse me, for 16-17, we do have some bids that are out and will be completing projects at Star Line, Havasupai, Nautilus, Smoke Tree, and Oro Grande. Um, and I, uh, I, I'm thinking of Nautilus only because Mr. Um, Gonzalez was uh, asked at the town hall what was needed most at his site, and he said his parking lot, and Absolutely. he is on the list for this year. Those are Thank those uh, areas that you don't think about necessarily. Um, there are some projects that if we want to complete them, we will have to put capital dollars toward them, and those would be uh, the completion at Lake Havasu High School, Jamaica, and Thunderbolt. Um, so moving forward with an additional of, an addition of some capital dollars, we're looking at spending um, just under a million dollars on asphalt projects for next year. This year, actually. The second list for you is the list of all of the work that we've done in our district from July 15 through August of 2016 that were funded by the State Facilities Board. And so unfortunately, it has to be broken in an emergency before we can ask the State Facilities Board for funding. And there's a, quite an extensive process for that. So you can see here, there's a whole list of items that are starting with what was the project that the board um, approved and then funded. Uh, Jamaica, Lake Havasu High School, Nautilus, Oro Grande, Smoke Tree, Starline, and Thunderbolt. You'll notice on the right-hand column, well, first of all, there's, a, uh, there's actually a state number that's assigned to these, and the State Facilities Board approves these, so those are available for inspection. Uh, and the money that is spent and the status is listed there. There are a couple of things that we do not get the money until after the project is closed, 
and then the state facilities reimburses us. So we have to fund these. You're nodding at me. I'm, I think I'm okay. Uh, fund these up front. The ones that are blank, they have some money is that we are either in progress or we're awaiting our final reimbursement. Um, some of them that have no information, they're still open projects. And uh, uh, there's a couple of areas. The one in, there's one in Havasupai, there's one in Lake Havasu, and there's one at Starline that the work is actually complete and we're just awaiting the actual finalization of that project. Then we have to submit and then they approve us to be reimbursed. So there's a lot of things happening in the district. This is a pretty comprehensive list that uh, the state is funding because we do not have the capital dollars to do so. But unfortunately, every one of these had to be broken before we could request those funds. I might just add that we've got the lion's share of the funding from the SFB because they know how well that we take care of our facilities and um, Messi, you can speak to the numbers because I don't know precisely, but I thought it was just a pretty big percentage of what the budget was for this year. I was going to say, I, we definitely have. Um, one of the issues is sometimes being able to explain that particular project or request. And when it gets to that board stage for the SFB, our group has gone down there to explain it. And that has helped greatly. So many districts don't have the kind of personnel we have or the experienced personnel that we have, and they haven't gone and haven't gotten their projects. But as far as um, the state funding, it definitely is. I did, John Simpson, say we got the, we got the vast majority of, yes. the, of the funds yes, that were yes. available just because of doing things like it that. There wasn't so that much money available. It was, it it was, was, it was, the lion's share of it. They only have an $18 million budget, I guess, this last year. 16, 17, and we got over just over three, I think, of it. So, over three, yes. Yeah, for one district, that's a lot. So, mm -hmm. can you see Scott Becker? <laughs> I thought you were doing something over there. I didn't know what you were doing. <laughs> He's going to ask you afterwards. On, <laughs> on, on that list, I want to clarify something on there. <laughs> because we have some very detail oriented students in front of me that said, What the heck is this? And if you look halfway down that list, it says principal's office. <laughs> yes, that has been completed. It has been completed. That is not just my office, that's the entire <laughs> office. <laughs> as well as the nurse's office that's connected to that same, same unit. So it's not just my office. So it's not just to keep you cool. Okay. Yes. Glad you clarified that. <laughs> yeah, so it's not just the nurse's office. Okay. 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 Um, um, and the, the last item is um, giving uh, information appreciation about our gifts and donations and one of the things that on the gifts and donations list I wanted to point out a couple of things one of them is that what you'll see here is a actual classroom donation through donorschoose.org so this is one of the first ones that are coming through on our new um, well we were, it was happening whether we had a policy or not so we needed to get a policy in place so that we could acknowledge those and so we do have a couple of donations that um, classrooms have gotten through donors choose and those are district property they are um, identified tagged all of the things that need to happen in order for them to be done as a regular donation uh, as far as large monetary donations Starline has been supporting the Renaissance learning program their PTSO donated almost six thousand dollars for that we see on this particular donation the listing of the K-12 foundation who we recognized last time for the twenty eight thousand dollars that they gave and Mud Shark Pizza donated $500 to each school in the district for the principals to use at their discretion for the things that they need um, in the total amount of $4,000. So we appreciate those donations. As we talked about earlier, the volunteers in our community and, and uh, how much they give. Okay. Thank you. Can I have a couple more items? Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I wanted to share because I keep giving us update on our attendance and our numbers and so um, we have been keeping track and I am embarrassed that I didn't understand that we had no shows still in those first numbers so I was so excited about how far up we were and uh, we actually hadn't dropped all of the no shows out yet but we are currently 38 students ahead of where we were last year at the 100th day and so we're, we're kind of hanging in and that about 38 to 40 kids above, so we're hoping that um, that we'll be able to continue that. 
we do not know that going into the current year funding that we are getting funded on a monthly basis by virtue of our students who are enrolled. So that's important. And then the last thing I want to mention is that I was notified today, as was the high school, uh, ASBA had invited us to submit to do a presentation at the ASA conference, our ASBA conference that's coming up in December because our ECAP process is so renowned statewide. And so the counselors at the high school put together a proposal to present and it was accepted. And so uh, we will be presenting at the ASBA conference in December on the, um, the ECAP <coughs> process to drive school programs. Perfect. So, very proud of our high schools. Okay. All done? That, that's it. Yes. Okay. All right. We got everything, Terry. Okay. Can we have a motion to adjourn, please? I move that we adjourn. Second. Terry. Yes. 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 Yes.